I have such an incredibly weird job. Uh, I heard that the wine, the, the chief critic, wine critic for the Wine Spectator does a thousand tastings a day. Now that is a weird job. You know, he walks in, there's a thousand bottles of wine and he just, you know, just, that must be a strange job. But mine has to be, and it must be a lot of fun for him. I mean, you really have to whatever be good at whatever that is. But mine's the same thing. So um, uh, this week I've been trying to write a review uh, for art form of Wolf Prix's Musée de Confluence in Lyon. And in order to do that, I mean, this is a kind of journalistic review. It's not an academic review. I've got a thousand words. I've got to speak to a general audience that knows nothing about architecture whatsoever. And they're mostly people in the art world who actually think they know everything about architecture. Because they think they know everything about form. They think they know everything there is about something that seems like art. They think architecture seems like art. And so they think they know all about it. Just ask any artist. And uh, <laughs> they know the least about it um, because they think they know everything about it. Um, so I got to write this thing for them, and um, which then then I had to kind of read all the reviews. I read all the reviews that I could find in as many languages as I can read, and then the ones I couldn't read, I just stuck in a Google Translator, and it was pretty clear what they said. You know, uh, it's irritating. Like I found something in Slovenian, and I put it in, and it, and it says it's irritating. It's wonderful, irritating. This is how it came out. Um, so I'm dealing with that, and I'm dealing with something about Wolf, and I know Wolf's work really well, and I'm trying to do that. At the same time, I'm getting ready for yesterday, where I know I'm going to have to talk to Eric. Totally different cup of water, uh, whatever that means. And, uh, and I think this is really great, you know, but they're totally just, you know, I don't know if you heard anything yesterday, but I, I, Eric is concerned with history, and, I, and Wolf is totally not concerned with history, and it's sort of, I'm dealing with it. And then today, I spend, I mean, I know Marcella's work, I think, really well. Um, and I, but I spend the last three hours kind of going over it again and thinking about my thinking about thoughts about this and this, this particular series, and it's like totally different. Like, I have to get in a different key, I have to think differently, I have to switch gears, and then I know Wolf's gonna be in the audience, and so, Anyway, it's an incredible fun, it's, it's so fun and so ridiculous. Um, I don't know how to tell you about it, but anyway, so this is it. So this is what's gonna go on. You guys, at this point, if you've been coming at all, um, you're either about to be one of these people, which is why you're here, which is, I guess, why Peter Tester is here, because I think he'll be next. He, he's not next, but he's next after next. And, uh, or you're one of my students and you've been forced to be here against your will. <laughs> or you're one of Marcella's students and you're trying to find out what you're supposed to be doing now. Um, but if you've been here for a while, you know that the basic theme that I've been trying to explore is what happens what, at this particular school, because this is a, a special school, a special school for me, a special school in the world of architecture, and how, how has the faculty developed in its relationship to other faculty differently here or at, at all here? Um, and actually, I think if you've gotten, if you've been watching, you've kind of gotten used to the point that there is a lot of influence uh, and there is a lot of conversation. And I, so I decided this time I'm just not going to show slides of, you know, Marcella's work before and then all of a sudden he meets Sandy Zago or he meets Tom Wiscom and they get to know each other and all of a sudden you start to see an exchange of work. It's obvious. It'll be obvious to you, to you now. And it's exactly the kind of thing you want to happen. And it's also, he's aware of work that's going on in the world. And so we're gonna take that for granted a little bit. I mean, you'll be able to see it. And then tr more talk about, see the development of the work and try to figure out what he's after. Because I guess the thing that's on my mind from this morning, after working with Eric and Wolf, who is that, Eric and Wolf have a very clear project. They are, they're after something in the world politically or existentially. Um, and the guys, the, the people that I've been working with in this group, that's a more elusive problem. 
Mars, I don't know if you're, you know, like, I think I can tell you a lot about the development of Marcella's work. I can tell you about the lot, a lot about the dialogue in his work with, as it matures and with other architects. But what I'm asking you to pay attention to as we kind of flip through some things is what's he really after? What's the architecture really after? Um, one thing that's clear, uh, you should know that um, he's been here, maybe like Andy Zago and Hernan, the whole time Eric's been here. Came here just before Eric came uh, under Neil. I think just before he came here to do a visiting studio, never meant to stay. He went to Columbia, studied with Evan Douglas. I mean, it, this is, you won't know what this means, but this is like saying he studied with uh, Hitler, um, Mahatma Gandhi, and um, who would the last person be? Uh, Robin Williams. I mean, it was, those were his three tutors. <laughs> so he studied with Evan Douglas, Jesse Reiser, and who else was there? Keller oh, Keller Easterling, yeah. The Hitler, I forgot that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, three really talented people that are like, you cannot imagine how they could possibly communicate with each other at all, and what a student coming out of that would possibly mean. Um, so fortunately, he brought something to the game. So anyway, he studied at Columbia, worked for a little while for Jesse. After that, you can see a lot of Jesse Reiser's, um, I think, some of the influences in that work, particularly with the early work with the, the kind of uh, the attitude towards patterns. Um, went, but then went immediately back to Argentina and expected to be in Argentina in Rosario and practice. And I think he got invited by Hernan to do a guest studio here, came up here to do a studio, not expecting to stay. And the next thing you know, he gets invited to stay and hasn't gone back since. Is that pretty much the story? So, uh, he is a, a person who, among all the people I know, um, never meant to do anything and still never means to do anything other than to practice architecture. And I think Tom Wiscombe is dedicated to becoming a practicing architect, and I think everybody that we're, that we're interviewing has an interest in practicing, but Marcello's work and Marcello and Georgina's work together uh, is just rich with an intention for it to be realized even in its most experimental level. Uh, that said, there are curiosities about it that we'll, we'll, we'll see. So this is the, I think, yeah, this is the first project. Um, you can, there's something you can tell right away about uh, the life today is that everything is in English and Chinese. Uh, when I was growing up, it was in English and Japanese. Uh, before that, it was just in English. <laughs> or American as we like to call it. Um, so there's this, uh, now, and this tower, which this is a, sp a spectacular tower. This tower could be done today, I think, uh, and be a current and important piece of contemporary architecture. It also is about as implausible as it can get as a work of architecture. And t but uh, you can, uh, even from this view, you can see the discretization in the, in the facade elements. You can see the fact, uh, um, you know, he, he doesn't show the base because he doesn't know how to actually build the base at that time. This is 2001, is that right? Uh, two, yeah. two, 2002. So this project is in his head and in his mind before he gets to um, Sire. So let's say this is the first project done at SciArc, but has nothing to do with SciArc. And so the themes in this project are Columbia and his themes and his desire to build. And it's in Busan. And Busan, as you know, is the, build, is the city that now has the world's longest cantilever for some reason that we don't know. <laughs> That's right. Because of some other nutty project that some other nutty guy did. And of course, the, the first thing you also think you want to do is take some of these pattern ideas and immediately make a garden out of them. <laughs> so, so he does this little project at, um, uh, with materials and conjectures or whatever that they have that place. It's a you know, gallery downtown. And this is kind of when I meet him. And all of a sudden, it becomes clear certain issues that, uh, that will, I will point out, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this, is that he's very interested in contemporary ideas that are coming out of uh, 
generation of his teachers and his colleagues, but he's also a well-trained formalist. He thinks as a formalist, he thinks in formal relationships. He didn't have Peter Eisenman, but one could guess that he had a student of Peter Eisenman or knew formal analysis perhaps from his training in Argentina. Um, he's not, and so he, he does it, it's in, in every project. So this project, which means by the way, issues like these kind of flows, which are, could be read intellectually, or could be there to be affective, to, to work at a very different level than reading. Start to raise questions because those two are in conflict. A project that calls on your attention to read it intellectually is not a project that's gonna be able to put you, in a, put you in a frame of mind affectively. And so you get an incredible thing like this house. Uh, the FYF residence. Now, so on the left side, you see a perfect example of a late formalist shear, where the, if you push them together, you see that? You see if you put the two together, this is the kind of thing Eisenman would have taught, and as you pull them apart, the, you get a solid void relationship, you see, in, you see an index of the process. Um, this, what you don't see, however, is on the far right of that, uh, a, so you get, the, you, get the thing, you get the thing sliding apart, but it's not actually rigorous in that every place that there should be a solid and void isn't quite rigorous. Plus, he uses a closed form so that the sliding apart doesn't really set a dynamic into motion. But, and then he puts this hinge right in the middle and then there's this second half, it's a diptych. The second half changes the tectonic logic. In other words, it goes from being a tectonic deformation to a plastic deformation. The force is then transferred to a second kind of, to this plastic deformation. And so, and then it reads not as elements that are shifting and shearing and uh, leaving solid void in indexical relationships, but elements that are bending in relationship to the form. Right? I mean, do you see what I'm saying, right? Yeah. I'm not saying that's what you did. And so this is a very easy to teach, but project, it's a very smart project, but it's extremely confusing about what its architectural ambitions are, unless it's trying to notate the, the, the idea that the deformable object in architecture is changing its properties. In other words, if it's a polemic project about the future of architectural pro objects and what their na the nature of the de deformations are, that's one thing, in which case it becomes a theoretical project but not a project whose effects belong to its own processes. But it stay, this will stay in his work throughout. And there's nothing else like this by any other practitioner at this school, and not many that I know in the world. And, yeah, so, actually, so that's why he likes the table set like that. Now, the project has a strange relationship to uh, a house by um, Nanako and Jesse Reiser, the Sagaponic house. And they use the same kinds of processes, but they produce the pool as an an aspect of the process, whereas he transforms the, the form into the pool. So the pool is there as a given part of the typology, and he lets his building form a relationship to the pool as it detaches itself from the second half of the building. So these are curiosities. These are, these are what I would call mannerist curiosities in a post-formal development project. Uh, they're, they're not naive, they're not pre-critical, but they're mannerist and seem unmotivated. They're just sort of experiments in curiosity. Anyway, I, I really love the project. Uh, and we'll discuss that. You know, then, he, then he starts to, uh, he's sticking, he stays, one thing, again, this is the same thing you'll see in Wolf, but you won't see in Eric, and that is this, just pushing a theme in every dimension and every materiality again and again and again to find out what it can do, uh, but with, it, with, with, with a kind of um, agnosticism. So this is, a, I can't remember, it's a bookshelves or something like that. Yeah. 
What is this thing? I forgot what it's supposed to be. Uh, there was an installation here, but it was uh, it was based on the uh, cafe proposal. So yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Probably the only installation that they asked me to do something. So <laughs> it's not really that great, but. Uh, but, the, but again, I think if by now you're starting to see it, there is a direct intention for you to understand the project. It goes from one thing to another, and in the evolution, you understand that. And because of that, the properties of the forms that it's engaging, or the, property, the very properties it's exploring, tend to get obviated. So, and then this is the, the conclusion of this sort of period, which is a nice little uh, art museum, I think, or art, I can't remember, it's a, it's a boutique shop in LA. Uh, now, uh, it, p if you were to read this from a Sterling Eisman point of view, and he would pick up this corner relationship and then reiterate it, uh, and he would move it in, move from it, and then develop it to that corner, then the, it would, this idea that it would stop. I mean, you can see this is one of two things. He's either developing an idea of a diptych, or, so he's either repeating the building to the left, and so that that big blank party wall is an echo of the big, plank, big bank, blank party wall, the gigantic with a picture on it, or it's a, I, uh, he sets into motion a force and then just says, okay, uh, I don't know what to do next. <laughs> I mean, it, so for an, Eis, for an Eisman project to, to pick up that kind of vector and set something into motion is because you want to acknowledge that you're on a corner and bring something to a conclusion. So it's an urban gesture. It would, uh, it's a corner problem. And then, but to terminate it in that fashion doesn't, it, it, it frames the project abruptly. And so it's really very curious. And, but at the same time, it has this fantastic relationship to that gigantic par party wall. So it, it, I'm not even sure you meant to pick up the stripes or not, uh, but you can't ig ignore the fact in this photo that it does do that. And so what, what, what you keep seeing is him discovering the potential effects of this device that he keeps wanting to explore over and over and over again. The device is two things. It's one of these pattern devices and it's modulation from left to right or it's linear modulations. And so it produces lots of effects, but the effects don't seem to add up yet to a project. And again, these are the two forms of tension I'm going to keep telling you about. It's exactly the same thing that Scott uh, Cohen used in Tel Aviv. One, form, one kind of formal environment helps you pay attention because it's making you, it puts you in a mood or a sensibility to pay attention, like rectangular forms clo uh, in, the, in, the, in the normal galleries. The other ones, like in the light fall, puts you in a, in a frame of mind of reverie or distracted attention. And so Scott, for example, is trying to be cunning in his use of those two moments of attention as a place of relaxation. No? Uh, all of a sudden, a new pattern comes in. This pattern is, I would say, a Psyarch pattern. You know, I wouldn't say it belongs to anybody, but you, you see it creep up a lot, creeps up a lot here. See, you see it in Tom's work, you see a lot of people's work. No one owns it, but a lot of people play with it. And uh, like, for example, it might be good for an entire island, or it might be good for a fence. Not quite sure yet. This is a, t <laughs> let's just see. Uh, this is, my favorite thing about this project is its name. Its name is Fake Plastic Trees. Now, as far as I can tell, a fake plastic tree should be a real tree. <laughs> so you can have a fake tree or a plastic tree, but if you have a fake plastic tree, it, I guess it could be a steel tree pretending to be plastic, but it's a really, interesting moment for me as a writer. I stuck on that for quite a long time. Anyway, it's in the, uh, your children are underfed. <laughs> <laughs> now, the, the big cantilever, uh, I don't know where this comes from, this idea of these big cantilevers. Uh, but I do know that there's a point where um, Hernan starts putting his buildings as gigantic creeping cantilevers over every, every big thing, and it's kind of creepy. Uh, 
Now, so this is the, so you, you think back to the first house I'm talking about. You think you think to Andy Zago's uh, cantilever. So he's interested in geometry, hard geometries in relationship. Not you know, it's to use topologies in relationship to geometry, and and. Uh, and it's one of the things you appreciate in Marcello, in, in Pattern's work, is not some kind of, uh, what would you call it, not some kind of loyalty to a body of form or loyalty to uh, an ideology of form, but mu much more interest in loyalty to a set of effects at a different scale that he can work in work he can work in crystalline geometries he can work in orthogonal geometries uh, but he's like the idea for example that this webbing would negotiate from the horizontal wall to the vertical soffit and also from a, di a tri well let's say diagonalized surface into what appears to be a waffle slab or to try to negotiate that is the experiment in this project. And so yet again, I can find, I understand every project. I think I think that's the point of this project. But I don't quite yet know the point. And, and the consistency of it is now almost 11, uh, 10 years old. Left to right, transitions from one kind of geometry to another kind of geometry, wanting to work out with some kind of rigor the transitions, do I read it? What's its point? Is there, for example, in the context, something on the left side of this building that a view, if there's some contextual issue, which is what this would suggest, like from a Gary point of view or an Eisman point of view or even something like a uh, um, Michael Graves, this would say, read this, you expect the context to do this. Uh, Nothing in these diagrams suggests that's the case, and nothing in the site suggests that's the case. And so it's this instrument that does, what, is there? It's a corner building. It's a corner building, yeah. Uh, it's a corner building, but not like on a corner. It's a corner building waiting for buildings to come around it. I, don't, I mean, you know, it's a sort of a building that's built with latent potential to do stuff, but nothing to do. These aren't criticisms. I mean, I, what I find interesting about this work is it's a body of architectural experiments. It's like a writer writing a bunch of sentence structures without a story to tell yet. Uh, about 2008, I'd say the color wars hit. Um, Cyark, would you say that's about right? 2007, 2008, Florencia shows up, Melina, and all of a sudden the lady color wars hit. You notice we've been sort of black and white the whole time, and then about 2008, uh, all of a sudden you start to see this. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good thing, and it, everything's purple. Here's one of uh, Hernan's monstrous monster influences. <laughs> This, I think, is called the white shark that ate whatever that was. Um, and, and I like this project, but I, anyway. And so, the, this, and by now we're fully into the feminine side of patterns. There are projects he, that they do, I think, are really, uh, this is, that's why I wanted, really wanted Wolf here. I don't know if this is directly having to do with any awareness of Co-op Himmelblau's work, but the degree to which a certain set of techniques about how one produces a, spe, uh, a sense of um, freedom in a space that I think trace to Co-op Himmelblau and to uh, the, Endless, ha I mean, to the open house, and you know, like this, like the switchback um, circulation, that little V. Th those are really not signatures so much, but those are el devices that I associate with his research. Um, uh, that he does a lot of. There's certain moments. This pro I feel like I've seen this project a lot. Don't you feel like you've seen this project a lot? Uh, 
But what, it, what you find is it's exactly in consistency with what he does, but then there's a way that influences by other people's work make him want to take his effort on that regard to this work. Because the great thing about this project is it's, is it's a tripart building. It's, you, know, you can see it's one of those three-part buildings. Um, and so I really don't like, I really do not like this project at all. Um, it has the kind, it has features about it that I think are just too borrowed. It's too, uh, I don't like the geode quality. I don't like the Mobius geometry project. I appreciate him exploring, I mean, it seems to me totally out of character of the work, uh, of his work. Um, and then, the, you know, so we were, we've talked about that. Um, it seems more like an Andy Zago, a little bit with some geo. It, it just a, it didn't ring to me to be consistent with his own body of work. But then after that, and that I really thought this was one of his weakest projects ever. Like I just didn't get this. Um, I still don't get it. But I, but I, but I do know that he's never done anything, or they've never done anything, that doesn't keep getting recycled over and over and over and over again until it produces something. I mean, it's the most interesting body of work in that way. And that's why I do think that his conversations with Andrew and Tom must be very, I mean, whether it's conversations in fact or conversations in the work, that is a characteristic of an architect developing work, whether it's an architect developing an idea or not. Because as you know, this becomes this, which for all sorts of reasons that I don't really think have anything to do with their design in particular, although decisions that are made in this thing are fantastic. The influence of a kind of Haydick background, the way this thing becomes figural, the bat-like quality of this, the legacy of something like hanging around uh, Jesse and having worked a little bit with uh, Evan Douglas and I mean, I'm sure it was never in the foreground of his mind, but for example, if you look at the pro, I mean, it's like a beautiful that thing. It's, like, it's just so scary. It's like the perfect place to graduate, under a vampire, with no hope for the future. <laughs> so, but I mean, it, when, when you get to the interstitial saddles, that's the place where it takes on that quality. I mean, so that process, which I'm sure is not a process of trying to figure out how to make it physical, that process is a process of going from one kind of massing to another way of thinking about the ground to another way of going into another, his, their tendency to want to make sure that there's a second order of geometry and second order of topological connection. So what you're seeing there is the house and the topology now being worked out instead of as a dialectic, as a, as a scaling problem. And it produces an extraordinarily interesting effect. Now, I'm gonna just end quickly on this. I don't, I'm, I'm not gonna present it, I'm just gonna show you this. I think this is the best project ever that they've done. I think, it, and I'm hoping he'll talk about it a little. It's a family of uh, four museums in Budapest, and according to my count, what's really incredible about it is that there's seven of them. So I don't know. As I, I count that you did seven museums, so somehow, I know that you, I know it's really four, but, so there's two here, right? Isn't this the Ludwig Museum and the, Na, the new National Gallery? Okay. Um, and the only thing I want to show you this is how important also it is for every architect to be aware of the dialogue that their own research is in is taking them to the dialogue with other people who are doing work. So, so there's the New National Gallery Museum and the Ludwig Museum, which we just showed. Um, and then there, and his process is for those. And then, um, and that, that is they. Uh, there's that cast, this is in Budapest. Uh, Budapest is somewhere in Europe. Yeah. It's very important. It used to be two different places, Buddha and Pest, and then they got together and became Budapest. Uh, Pest had to move a long way. And then this is, uh, so now this is, you're going to love this. 
Oh, by the way, so this is Stan Allen's uh, entry for the Maribor Museum competition. Maribor, Maribor is also somewhere in Europe. And, but you'll see, it's the same idea. You take a prismic but non, not, not platonic geometry and you float it on top of a river of glass, you can see on the diagram. This, I must have now 50 or 60 of these parties. The first time I saw one was uh, David Chipperfield's uh, boating museum in which he put a terrible house on top of a glass. I mean, it's a really terrible project, but it did seem to set into motion a typology that you're now seeing a lot. Um, and I would say this project, you're not uncomfortable with the fact that this project belongs to that typology along with a, a whole set of other projects. But it does use the four buildings to negotiate uh, incremental relationships to the ground that you can read. You, um, but in particular, I'll just show you one piece. Uh, now look, for example, to use these kinds of um, ineffable geometries, geometries that aren't supposed to belong to the site, aren't supposed to belong to Budapest, they're supposed to have a mysterious quality, they're not really supposed to be about being understood, and then to use it to hold a corner that tightly would be two mixed signals for me. That's, in other words, to use it in such a highly formalist fashion uh, at an urbanistic scale would be contradictory for me. Uh, and, but then to elude it as a broken wall or as a lithographic wall rather than an architectural wall is also to do so, is to set another kind of mystery into motion. So you have an architectural wall, it's a lithographic wall, or mean, meaning a piece of rock, then penetrated by these gigantic crystals. Um, so each of the building operates in a really different way to set a kind of, it's, a, it's like four small symphonies using the same thematic material, but four small symphonies that are really not about each other. Um, and then there's this one drawing I wanna show you, I'll quickly close on it. Because it's very surprising, I think. Uh, that's the music, music museum, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now look, you see the lock and key site plan. So this is what is one of the what are these two? Architecture and uh, photo photography. Photography. Yeah. Yeah. So those are the four: the music museum, the architecture and photo, <laughs> ethnography, and uh, new national gallery. So what's the one on the corner? Ethnography. Ethnography, it's, it's okay. On the street, yeah. And the Ludwig Museum is? It's the second of the National Gallery, which is like. Okay, the so you don't count that as a, so you count that as one thing. There are six museums, there are four buildings. Okay, so I was right, there's seven. Okay. So you see how, I don't know if I can have it in a site plan. Do I have the site plan on it? Uh, I think there's a site plan. Yes. These two buildings form a lock and key relationship. Okay. You're leaving? No, you can't leave. Okay, I gotta, I'm gonna be quiet. Okay, anyway, they form a lock and key relationship and you can read it immediately. So there's a white one, there's a black one, and there's this lock and key and you read it just like that. And that says one kind of lo architectural logic that does not belong to this enigmatic relationship. In fact, it's a kind of power relationship. Uh, and so the other, so you have three kinds of, you have architecture that speaks against a certain kind of power relationship, setting forward a new kind of power relationship, and then a new kind of site relationship, and then one floating in the middle, which is the music. Is that right? Okay, so those are the things I wanna set into motion, like what is this adding up to? So is you, the point being, I can interpret, 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 interpret every one of these things, and I think they're pretty clear, and I still can't make, add it up yet to a project, and I'm, try, I'm trying to wonder, maybe that's where we are. It's a little bit like the Lego movie. So, all right, great. Okay, you should know that, and we spoke about this a little bit yesterday, and I think it's almost a ridiculous position, but it's a position he holds dearly, and for really deep reasons, that he's only interested in the experience, of, the experience of a building. That's Wolf's only interest, is that he builds a building, he designs a building so that it affects people when they experience it. 
whether they're in it or around it or in the city. For me, I think for most architects, they understand that there's a whole repertoire of ways that architects can influence people, how it's published, how it's thought about, unbuilt work. Uh, and I think a lot of Marcello's work takes that as it's uh, a, a given. So let me just start with you on that. Uh, OK. Um, I don't know what, I mean, I'm really bad at conversation. So I'm usually like, better at lecturing and okay, well, lecture controlling me. my own space. But I um, mean, you said a lot of things. You know, I think some of them are actually a lot of interesting questions and, and, and some wrong. Well, I mean, I don't agree with all of them, for sure. But um, I think that the, I mean, whether I have or not a meta project at the level that you are saying, I can't really, you know, like, like recently I saw Boyhood. No? Oh, yeah. You know, and it really got me thinking into, you know, what it means to do something for 12 years. And, you know, like I thought what I was doing 12 years ago, that's why I was, like, relatively relentless in putting this together. I wasn't trying to edit too much. Uh, I mean, I, I could have had a more, uh, like if I wanted to make a more cohesive line of work to show uh, it could have been done, but that's not the intention, clearly. Um, but I was thinking whether, you know, there is such a thing as that coherence, no, that can you put, can you work something for 12 years or 15 years in this particular case and, and still have like a, such a cohesive, you know, uh, product or style-wise, let's say, formally, you know, uh, because I am really interested in form. I I'm, I'm can't really say at, the, at that level, but I'm also a little bit uh, not that concerned that, uh, or at least not concerned in, 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 that, in that extent that, that architectural form at that level, let's say, that the shift between um, dialectics of continuity versus dialectics of more kind of breakages and uh, will mean so much, you know, in the kind of long run. I mm -hmm. think there's certainly issues of dialectics and oppositions and, 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 and deep differences at the level of the way we tend to work and try to find those conditions. I think those conditions are, uh, they're disciplinary, they're interested in terms of, you know, the way we see the world, like from the politics to culture, to infiltrate those conditions, to always maintain the work in a kind of level of, I don't want to say undecidability, but like that so it's not going to be firmly read and comfortably in one or the other camp, let's say. And so uh, I forgot the nature of your oh, no. final question, but I think for me the, 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 diff the question I have no answer or clear one, you know, is that uh, your, your, your first question whether there is a sort of meta project. I think there is a meta preoccupation, and, but I also think that I think the kind of, I don't know, I learned after worrying too much, I learned to be a little bit more uh, easygoing on this kind of Eisenmannian idea and implication that there has to be a priority a project and that you have to be so aware of it because it feels that it's a little bit antithetical to the way, you know, we do. I think you said, I, I was always interested in, in practice, uh, but practice is sort of like so kind of castigated in, in America in the way that it feels like commercial and it feels like if you're interested in practice you're not interested in the discipline or you're not interested in drawing or you're not interested in concepts and and that's never been um, the case in, 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 in what we do or what I do so um, so yeah having said that I mean I think the, the, the kind of commitment to architectural practice as a sort of form of thinking and architecture as a form of knowledge it's something that I'm you know uh, incredibly curious and I think uh, I don't know, for me those issues are, are quite important in, 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 in the way the work kind of develops, let's say, you know, and we can talk about these things, I mean, some of those are not necessarily the most interesting thing. Then there are obviously discursive issues which are obviously more on the, let's say, on the periphery of that, you know. But I would say, uh, if I think about the way I do things, you know, when we start doing a project and the things we will do, uh, they're not that different than what we will do 10, 15 years ago, you know? I think the thinking, the ideas, the way I would maybe describe things or we would, the way we will talk these things in the, in the office would be very, very different. 
but they're not that different. You know, they're not that different. These projects between you know the final project between some of the early things. You know, maybe certain conditions will be different in a way. So, well, you know, yeah. Well, I'm only worried that Wolf's going to have to leave. Wolf, look at me. I love the track. Okay. <laughs> I just, what's your reaction to when you see, I mean, you know Budapest well, you probably know that competition well. What's your re reaction to you? Yeah. Use the mic. Uh, or use a mic. Actually, or just in I, general. I, I like your presentation and I like the projects because they are very elegant. So this is a new discussion point, the elegance in architecture. And but I don't know whether that leads to something which is really new, because we are all elegant, and all projects could be explained in a very elegant way. The presentation underlines the elegance, white and black, and uh, I think this is not the way it should be. I know a project which is very white, and it's only space, this is the project of Saha in Baku. Mm -hmm. It's a, a beautiful reference to uh, Niemeyer's chapel in Brasilia. Yep. And this project is awarded many times, I think. Everyone here likes the project. The project doesn't work. It's only a project. It doesn't work as a cultural center, it doesn't work as an exhibition space. And I think that's the end of elegance, because it's a very elegant uh, project, yeah, mm -hmm. very elegant building. It's almost very well done. Details are fine, but it doesn't work. So it stands there as an elegant project. And what does that mean? in the field of architecture, meaning in the next, um, I'm talking about the next step in architecture, otherwise I'm not interested in, in a discussion because what's done, it's done, we shouldn't discuss it. This is my point of uh, history. Uh, so what is the next step you guys have to do? Is it just presenting project, building project, elegant project? Where is the impact? You, um, I read your article about Lyon, and you mentioned also the word discipline. You know, this is, in German, this is a, a word with a very, very bad connotation. That means, because in the military language, discipline is the point. Yeah. No, I, I, in so fact, it's, it's true in English, we, too. It, it, and <laughs> it, I do it on purpose. I know, it's true. I mean, it's a yeah, yeah. discipline and punishment are the same thing. And so I return to the word so, to have an impact, yeah, but to make people. Congratulations to your projects. They are very elegant. But, okay. but Tom, this, is this the next step in architecture? Well, we're going to find you out. You want to do for your, for your lifetime? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I think you don't you want to answer uh, that? No, but you yeah, want no, to do. I mean, I <laughs> I don't want to. Being disciplined, inelegant, forever. Yep. Um, give him a chance. Marcelo. I don't. I don't agree with the elegance okay. thing. You know. I mean. I think it's a different. Um, so this is the only thing I thought. You know. I mean. That's much. Um, I don't want to. Let me this way. I have a huge amount of respect for 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 your work, of course, and, and I'm not even close to where you are. So I don't want to set by any chance. You know. The kind of trying to um, authenticate what we do, you know, in relation to, you know, to, but I think, uh, and I, I will have maybe similar, um, you know, skepticism about the sort of, you know, too styling or, or too elegant, and, and, and maybe you, I don't know, maybe you have a point. I don't see that, I don't see the, the, the elegance as being a kind of, a, a, you know, something that defines the, you know, the, you the entire project, yeah. No, uh, you should not. Yeah, and in the label that the Saha and Patrick does it, you know? Yeah. yeah. It looks very elegant. <laughs> so, yeah, it's yeah. Uh, great. I, yeah. I don't know whether uh, it's intended to be elegant, but it looks very elegant. 
I mean, that, that, that word is complicated because it has a certain kind of ownership associated with it. Um, but, but listen, I, I wanted to say, I, I think, you know, I, I'm, I'm really familiar with your work, Marcelo, and, you know, we're the same age, and it's, mm. been, it's been really interesting to yep. see it transforming. I also, I perked up when you, I, you started to talk about it even as a conceptual project. I, I've never thought about it that way, but then I started to look at the diagrams and the way that you represent it and the way that there is a, um, a way of, of unpacking the project, which is really intellectual and not based on you know sensation or the eye or other things mm. and and I think that is part of your work and and I'm noticing in the most recent work that um, that that's coming into the forefront and I think that's I, well, I don't know you tell me but it seems like it's part of your natural development to move away from the transformation projects that you were doing before but it's also it seems to be a generational thing and I'm and sure. I wanted to ask you the question like to what degree do you find that the more recent work is sort of coming out of having worked on the other things? And to what degree is it, is it um, are you being impacted by things from the outside? No, listen, I mean, I think I will not sit here and not say that, you know, there's obviously influences here. I mean, I think obviously the, I mean, you were asking about the cantilever. I think, you know, when we started teaching together, I don't know, for me, like, it was important, um, like, certain influence of colleagues that are looking at maybe similar problems in different ways, you know? I saw Tom's influence in, uh, you know, in my understanding of mass in relation to whole fields and, you know, coming out from an idea that, like, certain things have to be kind of morphing was quite important, you know? And maybe some of the sort of maybe early and not so uh, maybe crude ideas towards cantilevering have something to do with Tom and obviously, you know, come back here. So, uh, and then there are obviously, I mean, there are internal things, ways of working, and this is what I would say, you know, I think those things have always been there. There's always been a kind of generation and a tracking on the sort of formal decision and an intention to have some economy of means as the way to produce form and being able to understand it, the kind of intellectual or cultural aspect. And then there is obviously, I mean, there's obviously a, a, a certain aspect of, you know, the whole object and uh, idea. I mean, I can't say I'm doing this because of a certain discussion, but clearly that maybe helps, you know, the whole, I mean, these things, everything, anything that got built, these things were always autonomous. I mean, in relation to the ground were sort of partial. So there was always autonomy of the pieces in relation to landscape and so on. And I think uh, that's actually much there. I mean, what I think, going back to this idea of the meta project, I think I'm maybe interested, and this maybe relates back to, to Wolf's idea of what I would think he thinks is, he understands that elegance is the idea of trying to make projects, you know, uh, faster and, and simpler, you know, without like, if early on it took like seven or 10 or 12 steps to do something, you know, we're trying to make them in two or three and to, to really even like uh, uh, take advantage of this accident. But we also don't want to make it too overly expressive either, you know, and this is maybe the difference, you know, uh, I will have with many, I don't know, maybe with a kind of, you know, with a school that is more on a line of uh, expressionism, let's say. Um, I mean, I don't know if that answers. No, it, it, yeah. it does. I, I just, I really like the, I just want to say, I, I thought this, the most recent work is, I hadn't gotten, as, I hadn't seen as much of it um, before today, but I, I, um, uh, I really appreciate that, that it, that, it makes me want to come back and look at it more. Like there, there's, there isn't a, um, a kind of beginning and end, or there isn't, there isn't a transformation in it. And yeah. I think um, you, you are getting a lot out of very few moves, and that is something I've been thinking a lot about too. Uh, what is, what is enough? What is enough? And also, um, mm. how less can be? And this is something that you and I are both working yeah, yeah, on. So yeah. maybe this is yeah. getting too personal now. But like, but, but it's, you know, how, uh, how less can oftentimes. Uh, sure. Leave more uh, questions open and, and yeah. give it more durability. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, exactly. That's that's the thing. Going back to the whole, for me, the idea that you could kind of, I mean, this is for me the dilemma of practice. You know, which is a very different problem. You know, of like. I think student. about why I use the word elegance because the white, the white and the presentation and the is misleading me. Hmm. Uh, there is no dirt in the drawing. It's very clean, it's almost antiseptical on one hand. On the other hand, the, 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 the renderings and the things are um, uh, more lively than the drawings are. Maybe this is the reason I say elegant. 
And the lines are really, and the shapes are elegant shapes. There's no interruption, no thing. It's, it's elegant. Nothing against elegance, but if, yeah, what's the next step well, yeah, beyond uh, <coughs> elegance? Mr. Kipenes can, can say that very um, clearly. Yeah, yeah he's, you, you know, well, I mean, it's <laughs> a kind of fashion, you know. <laughs> you have to wait to the, my, you have did to you wait to... Uh, did you see him five years ago? Now he's elegant, he's wearing a suit, a tie. Maybe this is the new step. Uh, just disguise. Um, <laughs> anyway, we're working on inelegance. Um, yeah. Yeah. You know, in mathematics, for example, when you call a proof an elegant proof, you're saying something bad about the mathematician. You're saying something mean about the mathematician. Like, for example, an elegant proof is a proof that's incontestably correct, but shows nothing to your fellow mathematicians about how you did it. So there is a great, one of the world's greatest mathematicians named Gauss would prove a theorem, but he wouldn't publish it until he had worked on it so much that it was incontestably true, but no other mathematician could discover the methods by which he used to prove the theorem. So this is what's called an elegant proof. So elegance has, let, let's put it this way, elegance can be as disruptive of the status quo when used correctly as it it doesn't mean it doesn't mean complicit i think what what it doesn't mean uh that it's complicit with the status quo and so the real issue is how you can use it um but one of the things i want to point out about the last project is it was Hungar a comp the hungarian one the hungarian one, yeah. Uh, yeah. is that it was a project for it was a competition for one building but rather, they, and it was announced that there was going to be seven competitions, or, or four competitions, four. I'm sorry, four competitions. And Marcelo and uh, his partner took it on themselves to design all four projects as part of their entry. And so I thought that was extremely interesting because that meant that the relationships that they were b building in there uh, were you know, it wasn't just the conceit of doing four projects, it was the fact that you wanted the, the, the set of relationships to be part of the concept of the project, even though those relationships were intrinsically incongruent in a certain way. Like, I think the lock and key, black and white relationship is totally different than the corner relationship yep. and the floating middle relationship. And so it sets up it's almost, I mean, you know, I keep saying it's like, a, it's, a, it's like a symphony with four movements, except they're really four movements from different symphonies. You know, there's a, beta, there's a classical period one and an and a, a atonal period, you know what I'm talking about? They really, it's, it's like put people put four tracks from four symphonies together, but they were the wrong four symphonies. And so I think that's interesting. And so for me, the elegance, could be working to allow that insidious part of the work to go, to, to take its effect. On the other hand, it could preempt that. You know, people could allow a figure ground relationship to, to preempt it, where what they understand is so easy to understand, they get to ignore all the other stuff. Hmm. Yeah, is, we should talk about the strategy of the competition, which is, I think, the worst thing uh, people can do it, uh, can do to architects, use, use them to bring ideas and not thinking about, realize them in the right way. Yeah. So and the architects are stupid enough to, to join the group like, like the, the Guggenheim in somewhere in Helsinki. Helsinki. Yeah. This is stupid. Yeah. But how can, how stupid we are you can read on the, on the 1,700, uh, multiply that, uh, let's say, 50,000 bucks, everything. It costs more, this, yeah, they spend more money to, the, the architects spend more money than the building will cost. <laughs> this is stupid. <laughs> anyway, so. You guys got yeah, 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 yeah. To That's experiment, it's okay to do so. I what I wanted to say, why I'm uh, 
uh, not to be misunderstood. Do you know how the old guys, let's say in the Gothic time, did do a circle? They had a circle, yeah, they, uh, in order to make string. Uh, a what? Use a string. Yeah, a string, and they did it in a big thing. But then they took a, a, a wood and draw the lines by hand again. I don't know why they did it, but they did it because it's destroying the clear uh, line of the circle. So okay. this is, I think it's a good idea. Think about that, how we can destroy the clear line of whatever we are doing, meaning doing a competition, being used by the client. I think this is, this is what we should talk about. I'm sorry. Tom, you know that, 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 that's, uh, that's why. That's my topic. My, because my sense is, that you're, also, is that you're also talking about form, and this relates back to the elegance thing. When you're talking about a kind of um, a, a roughness or a, a yeah, we know, are talking a, about a rawness, the style, yeah. not form. Yeah. I, I think we should introduce the word the word gestalt. Form and shape is one thing. Gestalt is more than just the form. Yes, and in fact, it's exactly. This, this is what I'm going for. I can read that in, in, in his project as well. I cannot read that in the uh, museum in Tel Aviv from... From Scott. Yeah. I really cannot read that. The Gestalt. Yeah, no, there's just an intellectual discussion somewhere in the ceiling. Hmm. This is a big thing. Well, I mean... Uh, it's a, yeah, it's, it's a, it has a being tough Being elegant too much. You know, um, <laughs> it's okay. One of the uh, is curious. I mean, you know, it, uh, one of the problems you have. I don't have problems. Uh, I have to say, I don't have problems. One of the problems I think you have. <laughs> no, no, say catastrophe. That would be right. There are no problems. There are only catastrophes. Is that people see your buildings and they think of it as something to be seen? So all the reviews are, looks like a lizard, looks like a this, looks like, yeah, you, know, you know, it's okay. I mean, I, I mean. This is, it burns in your eyes. Yeah, so yeah. Lizard, it's a bit, a it's a, you know, like the, the beginning of Beethoven's Fifth, which you all know. The beginning of? Beethoven's Fifth. Da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 da. yeah. Yeah. Okay. The reason he does that, yeah, yeah. the reason he does that, and the reason he plays it so loud, <laughs> it's a stupid little thing, you know. It's you know it's supposed to be fate knocking at the door. Yeah. 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 Okay. It's actually structures the whole symphony. What you don't know is that for the next four movements, all it's you every note of the next four movements yeah. are based on that, and you barely hear it. He plays it loud, you, it catches your attention, and then he uses it to hold the whole symphony together so that he controls your feelings and emotions. And what Wolf yeah. does is uses a big, when you first see it, and then he holds the whole building together. You're not seeing it anymore. That's how it works. That's how it moves into an affective zone. And that's what I'm saying. I don't really think the visual elegance matters unless it allows you to dismiss everything else. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's, I don't, for example, if you walk in the building and it becomes nothing but pure atmosphere, you know, like you do, like at the interior shots, I mean, part of that is just to win a competition. Part of it is what, what it takes to win a competition. And part of it is, uh, and there is some issue about should architects show their competition entries to their colleagues as a way to discuss their projects. I think that might be no, a better thing to for should, sure not. Should not, because I think it's a little bit insulting. Yeah. I mean, you have to sure. say one thing to your a client. Uh, you don't lie to your client. Different than the yeah, you know, but I mean. To fake, you have to fake something. Yeah, fake, I mean, you know, that, those, to hide something. But for example, <laughs> I, uh, I think yeah, your use sure. of lighting 
I think you know, lighting is a real problem uh, in buildings. You know, it's so degraded by all over the world that even though you're trying to use projective lighting in the cantilevers to do a completely interesting thing, to, to move the weight from heavy to light, uh, it would, might be perceived as just more trite theater lighting by a critic who is unfamiliar with the project. I actually like, I like your interpretation of this fits of Beethoven, but you don't know the real story which is behind. Because <laughs> you're from Vienna, you know the yeah. real story. <laughs> which it's very is, different. What is the real story? They, you know what the Heuriger is? This is a, a kind yeah, of, of wine restaurant. And Beethoven was sitting with his servant and was drinking, 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 drinking. And the servant said to him, Meister, uh, I have to say it in, in German. Meister, can we go home? I so, thought, uh, yeah, can we go home? And he didn't react. So the servant said, Meister, Master, can we go home? <laughs> and Beethoven answered, Oh, I only hear dun dun dun. <laughs> See, this is the story, the real story, how inspiration comes to. The artist. I see. I like mine better. <laughs> yeah, but if, yeah. I have you never, have to. You have to. I but have never liked the truth better than my stories. I must. Yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> you, you like your, your <laughs> stories are the best. I know. I want to. <laughs> and your writing is the best. I want you to look at the the drawings though, because if you look at the paving pattern in the Budapest project, what you're going to see are the pavers from the very first gardens. In other words, that is the thing I think is really important to pay attention to is it is doesn't, it's not that it becomes a kind of signature, it's that he, it, it's a device that he knows how it operates. And so it's not a decorative device because in each building it plays a separate role. In each building, one of them is used for orientation, one of them is used for disorientation, and so I just, you can analyze and analyze and analyze and analyze. And that's what, the thing that I think is fantastic about your work is how, mm. how much it gives to another architect to analyze. Uh, but I think that's where- Where are these uh, drawings, the competition entry? What are these? Yeah. 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 Yeah, um, yeah because I mean, all the, the other stuff was post-production. I mean, there was a lot of post, because you did mm. stuff for the book, I mean. For example, that was it was post production on the just on the pavilion, like the no, Those no, were, no, it's all no. no. I mean, this is yeah, no, we don't. I mean, there are some drawings that are like often done after, but it's usually. I mean, you were saying uh, one of the challenges for me of working on four projects at the same time uh, was to actually to work on a project and not work on. Uh, a single formal idea in four sites. And how to do that and still claim a project, and you know, you could be critical, well, you know, you take away certain drops about like the projection of a, of a pattern or shade and shadow, and then the things might look different. And it's, it's true, but I, I'm interested in the format. I don't think it should be like the same thing over and over. And, and uh, so for me, I don't know, I think it was important to try to do that, you know, and uh, these are four separate things, they were presented as separate things. Uh, the only drawing that wasn't presented in the competition was the drawing that put them all together because it was out of the, out of the requirements. But the idea of like, you know, to have a, a project and not necessarily rely only on like, um, you know, on doing certain kind of form, let's say. Like, I mean, the project in the corner is very, very different and it meets the ground very different than oh, the yeah, other one. Absolutely. I would consider all of them as sort of, you know, mute icons, you know, which is something we're kind of writing and but talking if you about. But you know, if meet you the let ground me... very differently. I mean, they're monolithic project, but, you know, you were saying, yeah, but this one meets the ground with glass and doesn't mean, and it's very different monolith than the one in the corner. I mean, they all deal with the idea of part to whole. I mean, in one of them, two of them, there are two museums, two separated, two together, but sort of in a kind of more complicated difference. A longer one where basically it's one entire thing, but it's sort of chopped uh, transversally in the, on the rooftop, so it actually has a sort of um, kind of complication in a way, which basically 
you could read it if you wanted to, you could experience if you are around, but there's a building in there that has really, it could operate relatively independently from that. And that's something that I'm very, very interested, you know, in the idea that, uh, you know, in some idea of autonomy and indifference of the architecture. Of course, I actually, I think experience is super important. I expect that there will be certain experience, but in this case, and it's funny you brought the idea of irritation. I think it's, a, I, I would say it's a different kind of irritation, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm after, we're after, at least with the latest work, which is one that will kind of perceive persist over time in a way. It's not ugly, it's not, uh, but it's not the most exuberant, you know, in your face thing. And this is obviously, I mean, with all the respect, it's, you know, your work is obviously very, very different at that level. So I take the idea of elegance as obviously a kind of a, you know, just a stark difference at that, because we work towards a very different set of effects, uh, definitely on the last work. How to achieve that with the minimum amount of means without turning into expression in some points, and obviously I can, mention that and I put some of the work competition ones which are maybe over the top I find them incredibly childish you know in retrospective and so are for me it's kind of well you don't have a ferris wheel sir? I mean, he's <laughs> there are childish all of us have done our childish projects you know you've I like it I know I love your ferris wheel yeah, I like it. Um, this is a kind of very naive way of inspiration <laughs> I don't like the, the, all these explanations which are, are not fulfilling what they promised. The drawing, the drawing, if the drawing is good, you can read. If I would be in the jury, yeah, I would say that you, um, uh, the drawings have a potential which could be developed to reali reality, yeah? Sure. Mm -hmm. Because never ever. A project which is delivered at the competition will build the same way it's delivered. Well, but this so, so this is yeah. my, my, my experience as a Euro. When I'm in the jury, I'm just looking of how could, could this project be developed. And I can see a lot of pot potential in this project, whether, whether they will do it or not. But Go ahead. This, this is no. very important yeah. for, for competitions. Yeah, yeah. But I hate this. No, I, 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 I think you know. we, we've, yeah, I know this, and I think that we, we, when we do so many competitions, you do a lot of competitions, I know. Um, it sometimes is difficult to, to tell anymore if that is, the, if that represents the work. Exactly. Yeah. Or if that represents a sum of all of the possible yeah. advertising that you made to try to get projects. <laughs> And and I think representation has a lot to do with that as well yeah. because you know like like the photo reel renders well, we have we all have to do these and and um and it might not be how we we uh, it might not feed our own development and I don't know I don't yeah. know how, what your feeling is on that that like it, has that taken its toll like doing all of these competitions or or no or sure I mean there's certain or? things that are like yeah they just. They just seem too much, you know, like you, you, that, you got too much, too many suites, and if it's like uh, when you change much. the competition and do all four four buildings, that's a different thing. You're doing a polemic project at that point. Um, yeah, and I do think uh, you do the same thing, and then you because you do post production. I mean, I think I think anyone in any discipline, every artist does that, that does competitions. I mean, every artist has a has a advertising. They have to. I mean, it's just part of the work. Um, no, this is. No. I know, I know. If no, architects just absolutely yeah. love to think that they are the only person that are plagued by the problems of architecture, and they are the only people plagued by the problems of architecture because they're not painters. But trust me, painters are plagued by the problems of painters, and yeah, it's just as much annoying. <laughs> yeah, but the, yeah. they don't do competition like we have to do it. No, that's true. They don't give away free labor as much as you do. They have to the just way go to they sucky use dinner party now. after. No, that's true. They're, architects love to be used. There's no question about it. Yeah, but this is they apply uh, to be used. Uh, no, not me. And architects this is are your problem, to not mine. <laughs> I don't. You've no, been there. No, that's because you. You are. Any one of these guys sitting here would die to get on an invited competition. You just are tired of it. <laughs> if if you get paid. Do competition. <laughs> that's that's the only. You rule. never get paid enough. You ever yeah, break this even? Is, uh, this is another discussion whether you get paid enough or not. 
the, the main thing is the, the, the investors and all the guys or the cities, uh, they are using you, your ideas, without paying you. This is, imp this is impossible. Can you imagine that 120 search, uh, no, the, the doctors who are making <laughs> surgeries, yeah? that 120 guys have to prove that they can make a, a surgery, a heart it. surgery? Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. No, <laughs> architects are doing it. Yeah. So this is... No, no, yeah. no, I mean, the only, for me, I think, okay, you can go on and I think you have Forever. the point. Forever. You have the point. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, you know, people are still going to do it. I mean, you know, it's like a way to work on projects you want to work. I think for me, there's another problem, which is a little bit kind of, you know, like, I mean, uh, I mean, it's similar to teaching sometimes, no? In a school like Sire, where uh, it's a kind of a constrained, constrained, free world, no? Like, I mean, you do have a brief and so on, but you could kind of like it's a different thing. You don't have a client that is going to say, "No, this doesn't work. I don't like it." You cannot. I mean, you could kind of go on a tangent, and uh, and sometimes, I mean, this is like for me the experience where where you take a building and it takes three, four, five years and you have to stick to that and you have to, you know, every lecture you have to present that thing and, and the competition you do it in three months and it's done and maybe six months after you thought, well, that was a shitty project, you know, I, I wish I hadn't done that, but, but you can do that in a building, you can do it publicly at least, you know, so you have to deliver and you have to find this sort of consistency throughout, or at least that's the way I think, uh, because you can't be just like, you know, like changing around, you know, too much. How you actually reconcile the thing? How did you begin to see like the opportunity on these conditions, but it, but not just see it as a as a as a complete different thing? You know, I mean, for some reason, I could see a lot of like breakages on the development of the work, but this, the four buildings that are there are you know span a period of like six years, let's say, from the kind of, you know, the word they were developed, you know, the, the moment they were developed, of construction takes longer. And, and that seemed pretty, you know, like, I mean, you were saying color, I mean, of course, we had this thing with color and so on, and then, but if in the building there's like really no color, you know, and the moment we have to choose color, it's like gray is the color we chose. So there's a certain thing which for me is interesting about building is that it actually confronts you with certain conditions that you know they're going to be there, and like they're going to be there for quite a long time, and it's just a different, a different appreciation. You know, it has nothing to do with social responsibility or like you know, like clients and so on. I mean, obviously that's there. It's for me how you see, you know, if you're interested in a kind of cultural level or practice or a conceptual level, as you said, how you're going to be able to like track those things. You know, back to the movie and so on. How you, you know, like this was a shitty idea. You started 12 years ago and now you have to present this. No, it can't be like that. It has to still be good. You know, I mean, it means that you have to kind of be editing and, and understanding how your work evolves and, and, and what really happens out there. Those are, for me, the benefits of practice. You have to go. Uh, questions? Anybody got any questions? Thoughts? Comments? Are your buildings energy efficient? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't show you all the sustainability diagram that you love so much. Yes. Yeah. Now that you are the expert, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I, go ahead. <laughs> Hi. Um, anyway, um, I wanted to ask more about a question, uh, an interview that you did with Hernan and Eric Moss for Architectural Review or one of the magazines, and you talked. You were uh, Hernan and you were. I was there when they were talking, you know. Yeah. Was, you know. <laughs> and you and Hernan were disagreeing on the idea of the tool and the production of the work. So the the work that's produced by the tool and whether the tool actually produces the work where you control it. And I wonder, as you're doing the work, how often do you kind of go back and allow the tool to take control? And then do you push back? Like, what's the calibration between those two approaches? I mean, it's a good question. It's also an old question. And I, I mean, I think the, the we'll try to stay as as away as possible from like any kind of one direct uh, expression of, of a single tool, at least. But again, it's easy for me to say this, you know, and, and not be saying like you know, there's certain uh, propensities on, on every part of the work, you know. Uh, but one of the reasons, I mean, 
in any competition, in any project, we always have like plans and sections in a kind of Catholic way, meaning they never ask for it, but I think we have to do them. It's like uh, is, is you I have really to like really, uh, you look at these things and they seem much closer to each other. I mean, like when, let's say, I mean, uh, the tool goes away or something, you could still see something there that is not going anywhere and it's very much uh, insistent. So, I don't know if that's answer your question. I mean, I would try to stay away from those things. But on the, on the other hand, you still have to try, I would say. You, uh, you should also be aware that <clears throat> architects rarely, artists, architects, human beings, rarely know the answers to that question. Um, they, in fact, they rarely know the answers to any of the questions we ask them about their work. Um, so for example, if you go back and you look at modern architecture, and you look at the evolution of the drawing instrument, the May line, the rapidograph, from, uh, and you look at the edge of a building, and you, what you will see is the representation of harder and sharper lines in the edge of a building because of the construction, the ability of, build, of uh, architects to construct that edge. So what you'll, you'll see an axonometric, and then you'll see an envy of the axonometric in a high rise. But no architect will say, at that moment, the tool started to take over my work, and I decided to make the tool the point of that building. And so, when you're, when, you're, when, you, <clears throat> when you're in New York City and you're on 6th Avenue and you're seeing the XYZ buildings, no matter if you're seeing the buildings in perspective or not, New York City and most cities that are dominated by modern architecture are, are axonometric spaces because the tool took over the building. So, I think you have to ask people that question because it's always interesting to hear. And there, 10 years ago, we believed, I think everybody was in, in a panic, that every school in the world had turned into the same school because the tool was driving the work. And they thought that that was going to be the case forever. And now, it's not the case at all. I mean, that tool is just a tool. And so, I don't, th I do think it's a very interesting question, but it's a kind of uh, psychological, existential, technical question that's constantly being reworked, and like smart people come in and do fantastic new things with it, and it's, you know. So it really is a deep question. In fact, it's why Heidegger starts uh, the most important book he ever wrote with the question of the tool. You know, so it doesn't really no. matter what he says. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, you, do you know why Muhammad Ali was such a great, excellent, unique boxer? Because he was able to change his strategy while he was fighting. And this is the answer to your question. Yeah? There is no recipe, but you have to be able to change your strategy according to the situation it, which is coming up. If you are able to do so, then you are safe. If you are stubborn, you are running to, against walls. Yeah, I have to do it because the computer says this is the most perfect line. It's not correct. Yeah, this is what I meant with the circle. Yeah, there is the, a perfect circle done, and then the guys did it with hand in order to break this perfection in order to give the circle a certain, a new connotation in terms of heaven or whatever. Yeah. So this, I think, well, I, I forgot to say what I like on your project. Yeah, finally, I could see ground plans and sections. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Which is out of fashion right now, or was out of fashion. This I, is great. It, yeah. was, it took me a lot of work. It worked, I had to work very hard to get rid of plans. You know, I spent most of my teaching life to get rid of, I can't read them, you know, so I tried to make sure they left. But the you can read books, so this is <laughs> enough. <laughs> For your work, it's enough. So what, the first time I ever heard Marcello lecture, one of the things he said is, uh, the quality of an orthographic drawing in its own right is important to us. Do you remember this? You know, so 
they'll design a plan and it won't be the question is not so much how accurately the plan relates to the building. Uh, the question is, what is the quality of the drawing as an orthographic drawing in its own right? So much so that they might change the building to get the, the drawing better. And I think that's an important ethos. Uh, you know, it matters. In the, in the presentation, I, I'm, I, well, I'll end on this. I'm just going to ask Marcella to explain it to us a little bit. There's this incredible quote. Um, I don't know who it's from, but it basically says, don't let dialectic, don't let certain issues bother you, like dialectics of yeah. one thing or another, because whatever those issues are, you're going to have to work through them, whether you like it or not, history or not. You know, you know, whatever, whatever you think you have to make a decision about, you're going to end up working through that in your work anyway. So just don't worry about it. And it's in Spanish, and I don't know who the author was. It's a guy, it's quoting another guy, Paul, Paul Benichu, apparently. It's like a, oh. but it's a quote from a, a, an Argentinian writer. His name is Guillermo Martinez, who's a Borges um, scholar who writes literature, essay, but mix it with a kind of novel genre. And I find it interesting because he talks about dichotomies and he has all these books which could be confused with like airport novels, and, uh, but then they're like super, super deep somewhere. Uh, the idea that you could kind of do an architecture or take on these like uh, seemingly oppositional issues such as discipline versus practice or I don't know like you know box versus some whatever thing or many of those issues not everything clearly uh, it seems like issues that I'm interested in, in, in taking on you know uh, and especially I find that today is quite complicated because I think I mean, you talk about competition and so on, but I mean, for me, there's something even deeper going on, the whole discussion between the sort of ethics of form and, you know, at one level associated with the star system, you know, which you, people like it's you over. belong, over. towards, against uh, social responsibility or ethics or uh, issues of, you know, environment and so on, and that sort of false opposition interests me a lot because it actually brings the kind of politics into what you do, and, and can you try to do an architecture that somehow, like, I mean, without being in the middle of the time, which would be really negative, but uh, find a way to like bridge a bit these conditions that are so antagonistic, and, and, and I think they're incredibly pervasive in our field, you know. I mean, academia, of course, you know, we're actually prone to do those things, you know, and make camps and so on. So, I mean, this is kind of, you know, the whole issue of dichotomies and, and you know, mute icons, which is already in itself a dichotomy. Can you work through what, you know, some of these things towards, Hopefully things will dissipate. You know. uh, what, what was the author's name? Guillermo Martinez. Michel Martinez? Guillermo Martinez. That's I'll send you the book. Okay. And so in his books, he accomplishes that, do you think? Yeah, because he talks, he, I mean, you have to read it, but they're basically... Are they translated know, into English? Uh, yeah, they are. Some of them, yeah. Okay. Uh, any last thoughts, last questions? Yeah, thanks okay. for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming. We'll see you next week. Yeah, we're, we're, we're,